Welcome to Engaging Experts, the podcast that goes behind the scenes with influential attorneys. Our guests will describe their practice and expertise. Then we will go deep on various topics related to effectively using expert witnesses. Hello and welcome to another edition of Engaging Experts. This is Dan Rubin, the National Business Development Manager of Roundtable Group and also one of the hosts of this podcast series. We have another great guest for you today. Bill Sean is the co-managing partner of the international law firm of Sean Colson, LLP, with offices in Washington, where Bill is based, Brussels, and London. Bill represents a broad variety of national and international corporate, governmental, lobbying, law firm, and trade association clients throughout the U.S. Bill has successfully tried numerous jury and bench trials on behalf of those clients in IP, antitrust, and other commercial cases as first chair for nearly 40 years. Additionally, Bill is an adjunct professor of legal ethics and professional responsibility at the George Washington University Law School, of which he is also a member of the Board of Advisors and a distinguished alumnus. As such, Bill is also a distinguished expert in legal fee disputes and a member of Roundtable Group's expert network, having represented lawyers in ethics matters before boards of professional responsibility for nearly two decades. Bill, I'm looking forward to diving in, but before we do, here's a brief sponsorship message. This episode is brought to you by Roundtable Group, the experts on experts. We've been connecting attorneys with experts for over 25 years. Find out more at roundtablegroup.com. Bill, Sean, welcome. Thank you, Dan. Great to have you here. So let's start uh, with how you got into the practice of law. Tell us about that. Well, it was quite accidental. I was out one night at a great party, fraternity party, and somebody said they were giving law boards the next morning. So I took the law boards and uh, just, it was a, obviously a fluke, but did amazingly well. <laughs> and uh, as a result of that, I got a free ride to law school and uh, decided that that ought to be the direction in which I was going. At the time, uh, I was dealing with the draft and Vietnam and a lot of moving parts. And also I was uh, in the finalist or one of the finalists, uh, three finalists for the uh, Nixon White House's uh, reelection campaign, the committee to reelect the president. Uh, fortunately, I guess the hand of God was watching over me because I didn't get the job. Uh, they really liked me, but they said they had an opportunity to have a uh, lawyer, a California lawyer who had had five years of experience to do the job. And uh, that lawyer was Donald Segretti, who ended up in federal prison. Mm. So uh, that was a real close call. Uh, it was either that or the rice patties. And so uh, law school worked out pretty well. You know, we have something in common. Uh, my loss, my LSAT scores were also a fluke, but uh, in the wrong direction. So um, tell us, how has your practice evolved over the years? Well, when I, I started out at the government in what they called the honors program, and it was a great idea. Their idea was that uh, they should pay uh, what uh, the, law, the uh, Wall Street law firms were paying at the time, which I thought was a great opportunity. So I went to work for the government, but I quickly found out that uh, the government is not going to solve many problems because uh, a lot of people just weren't too terribly motivated and di didn't really care. So although I had a two-year obligation, I left for private practice in 10 months, and I went with a uh, boutique firm that did energy and transportation and regulatory work. And uh, for about the first uh, five years of my practice, I did a lot of work in the transportation field, including lots and lots of litigation, hearings and trials and things of that nature. It was a real baptism by fire. I didn't know it at the time, but I was replacing two associates uh, when I joined the firm. So uh, I, I had uh, a few years of uh, 12 and 13, 14 hour days. Double the work than you expected. Yes. Wow. And well, so were there any, was there ever a time where you thought you would not be going 
into the practice of law to begin with? Or was it no, always once something? I was once I was there, uh, I found that I liked it and I had a modicum of uh, uh, talent to be able to do it. And I found it enjoyable. Actually, when I first started it, I just couldn't believe that people paid me to do this. Uh, it was a, a lot of fun. And the idea of advising people and then uh, dealing with intellectual challenges, uh, I just thought was absolutely fantastic. Well, you're very self-deprecating, obviously you have more than a modicum of, uh, of aptitude for it. Along the way, have you had any, any particular mentors that you would attribute uh, some of your, you know, your successes to? Yes, I think there are two that I think of immediately. One is my, uh, was my father-in-law, who has since passed, who was just one of the most wonderful people imaginable a very successful person, a uh, former uh, Mennonite in Pennsylvania with an eighth grade education who went on to found one of the largest public companies in America. And uh, I just never knew somebody who worked so hard, in part because he just had an eighth grade education, but who understood people so well, was so kind, and was so perceptive. To this day, I try to run meetings as he did. He would always somehow seek out that person in the boardroom who was not saying anything, who really did have the best idea or the biggest question that should have been asked. And so I try to emulate that uh, every day. Mm -hmm. uh, the other uh, mentor was... Uh, my high school football coach, who was just a phenomenal human being, wonderful person. And when I say high school football, I played four years of high school football at a little over 100 pounds. And so uh, anybody who could put up with a little guy like that for four years was uh, saying something. Uh, but the character and his honesty and integrity uh, are with me to this day. He, too, has unfortunately passed. So, Bill, I mentioned at the outset that you are an expert in your own right in legal ethics and professional responsibility and legal fee disputes in particular. Tell us, how do you use experts in your own practice? Well, I use them in, in two ways. Uh, the first of which is, and I, I don't see a lot written about this, but uh, we have testifying experts and we have consulting experts. And uh, I'm a great believer in consulting experts. The benefits, obviously, of a consulting expert is that uh, they, their work and their work product is protected by attorney work product and, and client privilege. Uh, there aren't the disclosure requirements that there otherwise exist under Rule 26 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. And so they're usually the people that we like to use who roll up their sleeves, dig in, and uh, do a terrific amount of, uh, uh, shall we say, homework and spade work. We're working on a major, major international financial case right now. And uh, we just had a, a, a long Zoom with one of these consulting expert type people uh, who really has just clarified this very complex financial system but would not be a really great testifying expert. Mm -hmm. When we look at testifying experts, we look for, and maybe it's because I'm a creature of jury trials, but we look for people who are going to connect with the jury and hopefully also connect with the judge. When that connection occurs with a testifying expert, it's a thing of beauty. And I've had instances where literally a testifying expert spent hours basically instructing the jury on the ultimate issues in the case. Uh, in one particular episode, even the judge was asking the expert questions about, mm -hmm. it was an IP case, about uh, trade dress type issues. So uh, when we do choose a testifying expert, we want somebody who has got that kind of rapport 
got that kind of a communication ability and also has a degree of uh, humility to be able to connect with the jury. Just like I'm sure anybody else, we've had good ones and we've had bad ones. We had one in particular in a federal jury trial in uh, California in a patent case who uh, was a former head of the patent office uh, and was so busy with other things and was just so highly uninvolved that he didn't even know the name of my uh, number two, my uh, second chair, who was taking him on direct examination. Really embarrassing. Uh, so suffice it to say, we never used him again. But uh, uh, the other thing that we find, of course, with testifying experts is that the reports are critical. And a lot of them, not a lot of them, some of them really need a lot of help doing their expert report, especially in a damages type case. Uh, so once again, it, it's really a key of trying to find that right person, that right personality, that right bearing that is going to play well with the jury. That's very difficult at the outset of a case to figure out how that's going to be. And we do like to engage our experts as early as possible to be able to bring them along. And that's why having a, a consulting expert can be so very helpful. That distinction you make between testifying and consulting experts, Bill, is such an important one. And it's a decision that our clients face on a daily basis when, when our clients come to us looking for either a testifying or consulting expert. Of course, it's not only our job to find them, their ideal expert, but we also add the value of, of assisting them in, in making that decision as to whether they, they truly need or want a consulting or testifying expert. So thinking about your cases and clients over the course of your career, where has that taken you? It's actually taken me, to some extent, away from the law. It first took me to opening up a car dealership, which the reason I opened it up was a friend of mine who uh, also raced cars. We had Aston Martins. Uh, we had the opportunity to acquire a dealership, actually to start one. And uh, so I uh, jumped in and was a co-founder of a, a now a very successful multi-brand uh, automobile dealership in, in the Washington area. And uh, through that, it took me to a number of other spots, including a uh, bank board position on the fastest growing community bank in the United States, and uh, a position with a German industrial group, and a partnership in a private equity company that uh, was uh, based uh, based in London that uh, I now run the Americas for, and it's been quite successful as a result, uh, and uh, uh, a couple of other uh, smaller opportunities, real estate development and things of that nature. But it was my, uh, my legal skill or my experience that allowed me to see and to understand what an investment would be, an investment opportunity, and uh, one thing has led to another. It's also, I think, ultimately made me a better lawyer, because whether it's in the litigation sphere or in the transactional sphere, it has given me an appreciation of how clients look at us lawyers, and in particular, how in many instances, we lawyers think we are a lot more important than we actually are, at least in the transactional sphere and the advising sphere. Uh, obviously, for litigation, uh, we are important and we are the ones who carry the water. But it's also important as a business owner to understand where litigation actually fits in the scheme of things. Businesses 
obviously want to avoid litigation. Sometimes it's not possible, but understanding what the business risks are and what the business objectives are is an entirely different perspective than you do as a lawyer. And to some extent, all of this has been a humbling experience for me as a lawyer to understand that we are just one of many cogs in the wheel who have a role to play, but we are not, as many lawyers are educated to believe in law school, we're not the be all and the end all of these things. So it's given me, as I say, a sense of humility. It's also given me probably a greater sense of perspective and maturity in understanding really what the legal component is of anything I do in the business world. And the business world now takes about half my time, uh, which is wonderful. And it's a great evolution from uh, having tried a lot of cases to uh, now uh, presiding over and owning a number of businesses. Well, so with your legal practice, your business interests, do you have time to do anything fun <laughs> outside of those? <laughs> yes. Well, for one thing, I am married to an amazing woman who is smart, intelligent, beautiful, and wonderful. And so we do have a lot of fun together. If there's one thing in life that is fun, it's time with her. I also uh, am taking German lessons and uh, guitar lessons, but languages are, are, are a particular thing for me because I grew up in Europe and my mother was European. And so I grew up, uh, among other things, speaking Italian and some French and then picked up uh, Spanish and uh, even Latin. Uh, and I still enjoy learning languages and uh, uh, dealing with other cultures, which has also helped me in business and in my practice, because uh, I'm well aware of how uh, non-native speaking abilities can really color what somebody thinks and understands. We've just had a situation today and just successfully closed an acquisition in my private equity company for an Austrian company here in the United States. And now we're having some uh, discussions on going further, and uh, we were ready to have a Zoom with the principals of the company in Vienna. And uh, I pointed out to my colleagues that uh, we really ought to put everything down in an email before we speak, because they often will need a little bit of time to review and digest before we fast talking Americans get on the on the uh, Zoom or on a conference call. And uh, sometimes I know uh, that non-native speakers are embarrassed to ask again or two or three times exactly what you mean or what you said or what that word was. So um, the languages are an important part of my life and uh, picking up German, I think is fun. I've got two of my children who speak it now. And so they're sort of egging me on. And as I mentioned, I've got those uh, guitar lessons that I'm just starting. And of course, I'm a, a petrol head, a, a car guy. And so I enjoy racing and uh, few people actually, I think, can have an avocation like that, that becomes ultimately a business, uh, which, uh, which ours is. We just broke ground on our new facility outside Washington, our new showroom and facilities. And so uh, that type of thing is uh, still a great deal of fun to me. That is great. So Bill, in closing, can you tell our listeners, are there particular legal ethics issues based on your teaching at GW that you would consider to be especially noteworthy today? I think, uh, yes, what we're dealing with right now is the election litigation, or I should say the after effects of it. And whether you are for or against the election results, I think that we as lawyers have to be 
very proud of the role that our courts play, played in the election litigation saga, which once again, probably is continuing. It was amazing to me to see some 80 lawsuits that were dismissed by various courts, by judges who were appointed by Republicans or Democrats, but uniformly they held the line and required proof and required substantiation for allegations. Of the three branches of the federal government, I think the judicial branch just did the most outstanding job conceivable in ultimately helping to hold our country together and our uh, and upholding our constitutional democracy. I can't think of a better place to end than that. Uh, Bill, it's been a true pleasure. Thank you so much for being our guest today. Thank you for being one of our preeminent experts with Roundtable Group. And uh, most importantly, thank you for being a friend. Thanks again. Thank you, Dan. Thanks for listening to Engaging Experts. Be sure to click subscribe so you don't miss our future episodes.